So I thought, okay, our students have some fundamental wrong ideas about the way the physical universe actually works. Okay, some wrong ideas and conceptual misunderstandings. So we sort of suspected that probably since who knows, a long, long time. All right, so some very bright guys said, okay, well, what we're going to do here is we will devise some test instruments by which we can give it to the students and start figuring out just what wrong ideas and misconceptions do they have. And there's a number of them that have been developed through the years. Um, one of the most well-known of them is called the Force Concept Inventory, which has been given to literally hundreds of thousands of students over the last 15, 20 years. There's others, conceptual survey of electricity and magnetism. Um, there's ones for quantum mechanics and all of these different fields, all of which have been worked on, designed, validated, all of these test instruments. Okay. And we gave it to the students, and the results confirmed our suspicions. They really are fundamental misconceptions and wrong ideas that our students have. So I said, okay, well, this is, good. This is, this is interesting to know. Now we can perhaps address what, where they're having difficulties in a more effective fashion. But we'll have a good idea. What we'll do is we'll give them whichever the instrument is, say the force concept inventory. I'll give it to them in the beginning of the course, and then I'll give it to them at the end of the course. And I won't tell them ever what the answers are. And it's a fairly, fairly long instrument, so they won't remember the exact questions anyhow. But by doing that, I can show what a great teacher I am, because they did so much better at the end of the course than they did at the beginning of the course. So that was going to be the plan. I'm going to be able to prove what a great teacher I am. And for conventional forms of teaching, the increases were very, very small. Certainly not at all what we had hoped. And so I sort of felt like that guy. <laughs> oh, man. I've been doing this wonderful teaching. What the heck's wrong? They didn't learn. Well, maybe the teaching wasn't so good after all. OK? So the next idea. And this is where physics education research really comes in. I do this course. I give the students, say, the force concept inventory at the beginning of the year. I give it to them at the end of the year, and next year I'll change some way of teaching the course. I'll make a change, and I'll do the same thing. Give them the force concept inventory at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, and I'll see if the change had made any difference. And if it made a difference for the good, then I'll say, this works. And if it didn't have any effect, then I'll, that didn't work. Okay, so you modify the teaching of the course, Use the changes in the performance on the diagnostic instruments before and after instruction to quantify the effectiveness of this new way of teaching. And notice what's going on here. We're, 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 this, is pu this is pure methodology of science, of physics. We're using the techniques that we were trained in as scientists, and we're using it to apply it to education. I will tell you right now that many of the results that we've discovered skilled educators have known for a long, long time. The difference is, is we have now developed a methodology where we can prove that this works, we can prove that this does not work. Okay? So that's sort of what's going on with physics education research. All right? Um, so the key results. Most important. Most students <laughs> learn best by interacting with their classmates, with their peers. They do not learn best by being lectured to. And that's probably the most important key result in all of physics education research. Okay? This has led many people to reduce or even abandon lectures entirely in their classes. Um, Alternatives include peer instruction, where you ask the students questions in class, 
and they respond sometimes with what's called a clicker, an audience response system, where they click in what the answer is in multiple choice format. Um, the flipped classroom <coughs> is taking that to a much greater degree where you use the web to deliver materials before class. And there's where the content is. And then during the class, you have the students just talking with each other. So that's sometimes called a flipped classroom. And then there's demonstrations and simulations. One of the greatest teachers I know is a man named Eric Mazur. And Eric is at, at Harvard. And he's very charismatic. He gave great lectures at Harvard in beginning physics. And the teaching evaluations of the students evaluating him all said at the end of the year, Professor Mazur is a great teacher. And physics sucks. <laughs> well, Eric says, this is not the result that I wanted. So he changed. In fact, he's probably the originator, certainly the most passionate advocate of this technique we call peer instruction, where he quit lecturing almost entirely. And as he himself says, I've moved from being the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. So that's a fundamental change in his perception of his role. Now, of course, today, this conference, we're talking about technology. So we're going to be emphasizing a little bit interactive demonstrations and simulations. But before I get to that, let me just point out something that I already said, which is that many skilled educators have known the results of physics education research intuitively for a long time, going back at least to Socrates, who knew all of this. Okay, the difference is we can prove it. And again, before I get back to interactive demonstrations and simulations, um, let me make a couple of just a very brief remarks about the origins of the conventional lecture which is still the mainstay of many classrooms. Where did this come from? This model that I get up here and I tell you the truth and you passively absorb it. Where in the world did that come from? It came from the Middle Ages. And what would happen is the professor would come in and he would read the book to the students. And a few days later, he'd come in and he'd read the book to the students again, maybe with some added commentary. And a few days after that, he'd come in and he'd read the book again. That's the origin of the phrase third reading, common in many parliamentary systems. This was the third reading, perhaps with even more commentary. This was, this was the primary means of education in the Middle Ages. Has anything changed since the Middle Ages? Well, yeah, the printing press. What does that mean? It means the students have the book too. If I'm the only guy with the book, and I got all of you people standing here and reading you the book, it's maybe the best thing I can do. But if you've got the book, what in the world am I doing reading it to you? You know how to read. So we are continuing to use an educational model based on before the technology of the printing press. This I find very bizarre. What in the world are we doing that for? But anyhow, lots of people do it. OK, so this is supposed to be about demonstrations and simulations. Let me talk a little bit about them. First of all, and physics is a long tradition of demonstrations. Most of the physical sciences, lots of demonstrations. When you don't have the physical apparatus, you can use a simulation, an applet, a flash animation. I've written a lot of flash animations. Students absolutely love demonstrations and simulations. They all love them. However, if you do the research, i.e. Use some, use, some, use some techniques of physics education research, what you find out is that when you use do a demonstration or a simulation in class, conventionally, the students don't actually learn anything. They love them, but they don't learn anything. 
conventionally means just show it. Okay? But you can make a very simple change to the way you use it, almost trivial. And all of a sudden, the research shows that the demonstration and simulation becomes effective. And it's typically what we call using it interactively. And by meaning interactive, what I mean is set it up, but don't do it. Describe it. Talk to the students about it. And this seems so trivial, a change, but before you do it, have the students talk with their neighbors about what they think the result of the simulation or demonstration is going to be. And get them to predict it. Either just amongst themselves, if you have clickers, you can have them click it or raise their hands or whatever you think is appropriate depending on that circumstance. And just that one thing will engage the students and the research will show that they actually learn. Then you can do it. Okay? And a particularly useful type of demonstration or simulation is one where a significant number of the students actually predict wrong. Because they, by having made the prediction and told their friends, I think it's going to do such and such, they're now invested. The result is now important to them. And so if, they, if their prediction was wrong, they're going to say, what? What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? <coughs> okay. Let me pause for a moment and see if there are any questions or comments about anything I've said so far. I don't know if that's good news or bad news. <laughs> Maybe bad news. Okay, Here, here's an example. This one, that, this one is an actual physical demonstration, um, but it could be a simulation as easily. Um, there's a circular channel is mounted on a tabletop, and in the figure we are looking down at it from above. So we imagine that there's this circular channel on this table. Okay, and it's fixed. And I shoot a ball in at reasonable high speed around the left side and it goes around the circular channel and it emerges on the right hand side. And we ask the students, which path will, will the ball follow? A, B, or C? Now if you remember your physics, or you are a physicist, you'll know bodies in motion continue in uniform motion in a straight line unless a force causes them to change that state of motion. Therefore, the correct answer, and you can do the demonstration to show it, is in fact B, but many students predict A. Okay. So that's what I mean about an interactive demonstration where many of the students will actually get the wrong result. And all of a sudden, <coughs> you could start having discussions, having them talk amongst themselves. Well, why did you think it was A when it was B? And some of them will actually say C. And you can learn a lot about your students by eavesdropping, by listening in on those conversations. Not participating, just listen. And you will learn a lot about what your students think about the way the world actually works. Okay? Any questions? Okay, well, I want to talk a little bit about um, the classroom, just, and this is sort of re emphasizing things that I've already said. Um, first of all, the best learning occurs when students work together in small groups. Best learning does not occur by someone at the front taking on the role of God or a priest who knows everything and just sends it out there and the students passively absorb it. That's not the way it really happens, okay? And the learning is most effective when it involves conceptually based activities. I, you give the students something to work on, such as the circular track or an anim animation, or a simulation. We'll see some examples of those if you come to the workshop this evening at 
okay? Um, and again, and this is sort of saying the same thing that's in the first point in a slightly different way. Um, instead of you as the teacher leading the discussion, you want to guide the students. Don't be the sage on the stage, be the guide on the side. So a guided discovery model often works best. By best, I mean getting the students talking it over amongst themselves. And I'll come back to that point in just a moment. Okay? So, what we're trying to do to achieve the best, the, the, the deepest, most conceptually based, and most satisfying form of learning by our students is getting the students talking to each other. And often they're not used to it. Often their teachers aren't used to it either. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some ways of trying to facilitate the student-student interactions. Just some tips. If you're thinking about doing this and maybe you haven't tried it or maybe you've tried it and it hasn't worked too well, a couple of, here's some things you might want to think about. Here's some ideas for what to do, how to arrange things that might improve the success of your efforts. And the first is group sizes. How many students should be working together? And we spent a fair amount of time actually looking into that. And what's the best group size? And the key to our thinking about it is how many communication channels exist between the students. So if there's two students, there's one channel of communication. Not very rich. If there's three students, there's three channels of communication. So there's more rich communication that can happen with a group of three than with a group of two. And with four students, I got one, two, three, four, five, six channels of communication, it's getting even richer. So you can see that the more students I have in a group, the more channels of communication there are, which the more richness it's possible to achieve when the students are communicating with each other. So you say, well, okay, that's great. Five. <coughs> and every time that we've, when we have tried to have students working together in groups of five, it hasn't worked. And the reason why it hasn't worked is because there's a tendency for a group of five to split up into a group of two and a group of three, and those two subgroups don't talk to each other. <clears throat> okay? So we found, found that in the work that we do with our students, the best size is four, Minimum is three. We, don't, we never allow two students working together or five students working together. So as our year progresses and students are dropping out or changing their timetable, we will be adjusting the groups. And we tell our teaching assistants, three or four, four is the best. Okay? Um, I don't have a slide for this because I wasn't sure whether it was applicable to the Portuguese context or not. Um, it is certainly true in North America that we have discovered that if we have a group of four people, and these are beginning under, undergraduates, first year university students, and it's three male students and one female student, it doesn't work. That the three male students will tend to dominate the one female student. Uh, is that true for you people, do you think? It's certainly true for us. That, mm -hmm. Worldwide, did you say? The other way around. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so three girls and one boy, the girls will dominate. That's certainly not the way it happens in North America. <clears throat> um, uh, in North America, a group like that, first of all, the boy would have a big smile on his face. <laughs> And he would try to take over all three girls at once. <laughs> so that's interesting. Okay, architecture. The design of a physical space, which is what architects do. It took me a long time to realize how important architecture was in terms of achieving a desired method of learning and interactions of students. And to talk about it, let me talk about an example. 
And the example is you're hungry. And you want to get something to eat. And how do you get something to eat? Let's say you go into a restaurant. And it looks like that. That, that took that picture in Hong Kong. Okay. What does the architecture tell you? Well, there's a big counter back at the back. There's a big menu board. Okay. The architecture tells you, you want to eat here? Go back to the counter and order the food. What do you do next? You pay for the food. Then what? Eventually they give you the food pretty quickly. It's fast food. <laughs> okay. Then you take the food to a table and you eat. Simple. You walk into another restaurant. It looks like that. What does the architecture tell you? How are you going to get something to eat there? You sit down. A server is going to come and talk to you. You tell the server what food you want. The server will bring you the food. And then you get to eat. And then at the end, you pay. So you get very... You act very differently. You go into a restaurant because of what the architecture tells you to do. I don't know if you've, if you've experienced this. I've experienced this particularly with an ethnic restaurant. A restaurant, <laughs> I'll sometimes go into, for example, a Chinese restaurant in Toronto. And I get mixed signals. And I don't, want, don't know what to do. How do I get something easier? Do I go and talk to them, or do I sit down and do they come to see me? Okay. We want the architecture to send a strong message about what to do. Learning is the same thing. You want to learn. How do you learn in a classroom? So imagine you're the student, and you walk into the classroom for the very first time, and that's what it looks like. So like this room here. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to sit down. Somebody will come up to the front of the room and will lecture to you. All right. You're supposed to write it down. And particularly, don't talk. All right. Because you've learned that you, since your very first year of formal education, when you were six years old, if you talk, the teacher says, shh, don't talk. So wait a minute. We want the students to talk. Yet if we're working in a room like that, if we're working in a room like this, the room is going to fight us. And because the room is going to fight us, even if the chairs can be moved around, the room has already sent the students a message. And so getting the sort of small group discussion happening that we all desire <clears throat> is difficult. Sometimes it's almost impossible, depending on the skill of the teacher. Okay? Um, so in this room, I would tend to have the first row turn the chairs around and face the people in the second row. Back in there, we're stuck. We can't turn those chairs around. Okay? Well, once we, once we made this realization about the importance of architecture, and it wasn't my realization, some very smart people taught me, we designed some learning spaces. So here's a picture of one of our learning spaces. And I know it's a little bit faint because the projector isn't as bright as it could be, but there's a hexagonal table, a six-sided table, sticking out from the wall, and there are four chairs sitting around it. And there's a computer monitor and a whiteboard. Okay. And there's no podium at the front, like there is in this room. Okay. What does the room tell the students they're supposed to do? They're supposed to sit down at a pod. Three other students will join you. You'll be sitting there with four students. And you're going to be facing each other. Talk to each other. There may be a physical apparatus on the table. There may be a simulation on the computer monitor. Play with it. There's a whiteboard. Write on it. Talk. And if you have that sort of a learning space, getting small group discussion to happen, it's automatic. You don't have to do anything. It just 
trust me, it, it happens. Um, I have to say, I've been in the undergraduate education business for a long time, longer than I will admit in front of you. Um, and when we finally made this conversion and started changing our method of teaching and built some learning spaces, it was absolutely breathtaking. I have never seen education happen like it before. Um, we've had many people who've come by, you know, visiting dignitaries and deans and people like that, and they walk in and they say, wow, I've never seen anything like it. And what's really the thing, it's the key. I mean, yeah, we have these wonderful activities that I designed and some animations that I designed and wrote, but really the learning space is a crucial component to it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, now, we are running this in our 1,000 student first year course. Although this method of teaching has now moved up into our second, third, and fourth year courses with our physics specialists. Okay. But this room here is one of four for our 1,000 student course. And we have nine pods in each room. So in, if we're full, and we usually are, it's 36 students. We have two graduate student teaching assistants present at all times. Um, and that turns out to be about the right number. That they're busy, but they're not overworked. All right. The reason for two is, one, the numbers sort of worked out, but also because this method of teaching is something that m many of us are not familiar with. Many of my teaching assistants, they've never seen this sort of education before. They've been lectured to since they were little kids. All right? And so by having two teaching assistants, I can have an experienced one and an inexperienced one working together. And then my experienced teaching assistant can teach my inexperienced one, this really works and here's how you do it. Okay? So it's 36 students in the room. Um, there have been other models. Um, coming out of North Carolina State, um, there's a very similar sort of teaching that goes on, um, which they call Scale Up. It's been adopted by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, where they call it TEAL, Technology Enhanced. I don't remember TEAL. <laughs> but anyhow, um, they tend to have tables with about 10 students around them. And they have 10 to 15 tables, so they'll have 150 students. Um, it works. It works pretty well. I don't think it works as well as ours, but my opinion is certainly not an unbiased opinion on this matter. Okay, thank you for the question. Anything else? Oh, yes, I have a question from a little bit back, but since you asked now, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to the group composition. Mm -hmm. Okay, then for those of you that didn't hear, the question is, I'm going to form a group of, we'll say, four students, which is what we do. Should I get my best four students and put them in a group and sort of order the groups so that they're more or less homogeneous in terms of student ability, or should I put the good students and the weak students all together? And frankly, that's a, a question that has occurred to us and many other people, and the way to... The, the, the really, the way to answer it is the research. And so far as I know, no one else has done the research, and we haven't gotten around to it. But it is certainly on our list. I will tell you that we chose to make the groups mixed. Okay? Um, now, as we proceed, and our term is 12 weeks long, and half at the halfway point, the six-week point, we change all of the team members. We shuffle them all up. Um, 
And we're not looking to, we're not so concerned about ability, but we are concerned about groups where a dominant personality has taken over. And we're concerned about groups where sometimes you don't have any strong personalities and nobody's really doing very much. And so we do that sort of changing, but not in terms of their actual ability as shown on their test performance or things like that. Um, we sort of tend to ignore that. Um, I will also say that when we do the change at the end of the six weeks, we spend an hour on an activity on good teamwork. Okay, which is an important skill that no one seems to teach. Okay, um, an anecdote, which you may or may not, well, I think is appropriate. Uh, I have a friend who's an engineering professor in Japan, and this is a technique that I couldn't get away with at the University of Toronto, they'd fire me. Okay, but in Japan, he has, I guess, more independence. And he teaches engineering, and of course he has the students working in groups because that's what engineers do. And he says, I try to identify the weakest member of the group. And I tell them, everybody gets his mark. So all of the team members, their job is to bring up this weakest student because his mark is going to be their mark. Um, <clears throat> it's certainly true that I never really understood physics until I tried to teach it. Um, I've had many TAs, my teach, sorry, teaching assistants, say the same thing. So if I've got a really good student, and I have him or her assisting a less good student, I am probably doing a favor to both of them. The good student will be able to communicate with the weaker student probably better than I can, and in the course of doing that communication, my good student's going to learn a lot. So that's my feeling and why we sort of decided but again, the lesson is, unless you're very skilled intuitively, which I am not, then that's the sort of question that we should do the research, and we do know how to do the research. We just haven't gotten to that question. <coughs> Great question. Sorry, sorry the answer was too long. Anything else? <coughs> okay, well, we're getting down to almost time for lunch, and I did promise you I will stop right on time, because uh, if I'm standing in the doorway there and lunch has started, I'm going to get trampled. So I'll be sure to get out of the way. Just, let me just close by re-emphasizing some things that I've been saying off and on for the last 45 minutes or so, which is the role of the teacher. Because it's different than what we think. It's different than the important thing that's happening for the students is not listening to us, even if we think it's true. Okay? <clears throat> so remember the goal. The goal is not to tell the student the answer because the research shows they don't remember. If it works, that's what we keep on doing. I'll tell you. Here's the answer. Okay? We want the students to discover the answer for themselves. Okay? And that's easier said than done. It's very hard. Your students are struggling, and you just want to tell them the answer. I know the answer. I'm going to tell you. Okay. It seems really satisfactory. It's efficient, and you can go on to the next thing. If only it didn't turn out to be so ineffective. And you can find that out by just asking about it on the test, and they won't remember. Okay. So, having the students do it for themselves, easier said than done. It's not efficient. It takes a long time. It's much quicker to tell the student the answer. Much slower. Um, you know, you, you, I could give you a little problem, it'd probably take you 60 seconds to do, that would take the students half an hour to do. But it's a half an hour well spent. Okay. So don't try to be efficient. Don't try to, a common problem is we try to cover too much in our classes. Um, a man I admire a great deal, a man named Joe Reddish at the University of Maryland, Joe, Joe says, the urge to cover the material, whether or not the students understand it, seems mysterious. 
but it's common. Why are we covering material if the students don't understand it? Okay. So you don't have to wear a toga. However, you do want to be Socratic in the sense of guide your students with questions, not answers. And I sometimes tell my, my, my teaching assistants, keep your hands in your pockets, both your physical hands and your intellectual hands. Okay. And that, that, that seems to be a way of saying that my, my teaching assistants can often relate to. So finally, I'm about out of time. One more remark. And again, something that I've said one way or another a few times today. Our students will often tell us what their difficulties are if we just shut up long enough to listen to them. Okay. So, I always recommend stop talking to them, start listening to them. You will learn a lot about your students and what their difficulties are. Okay. So, stop a little bit early. Thank you so much for your time.